Mike Broadbent. I am the publisher of Law Careers Net and the Training Contract and Pupillage Handbook. These are specialist resources designed for people who are looking to begin a career in the legal profession. The idea is that we are there to provide information at whatever level you are about how to go about becoming a lawyer, understanding what becoming a lawyer involves, and giving you the techniques and information you need to successfully uh, pursue that aim, and finally to provide information on the type of organisations and places who may give you a job in the future. Today I'm going to focus on how to win a training contract, some of the, some of the techniques required for winning a training contract. That doesn't mean to say that this information does not apply to pretty much every other aspect of the uh, legal profession or indeed any other uh, profession. What Abraham says, uh, as you can imagine, I will be reiterating in many ways. The core information that we're looking at here, the core techniques we're looking at here are not really rocket science. A lot of it is to do with actually being organised, understanding how things work and acting accordingly. So first thing to ask you, the well, first thing to do is look at this, this quote here, because it's slightly alarming. Uh, in 0910, there were fewer than 5,000 training contracts handed out. Previously, there were 6,000 going per year. The numbers have written, risen a, couple of, uh, a little in the last couple of years. However, it remains the case that there is an oversupply of people who want to become training solicitors compared to the number of jobs that are available. So, one of the first things you have to accept is that you are in an extremely competitive environment, market. You are looking at the person next to you as being a competitor for one of those rare jobs that you're looking to win. So, always bear in mind, you need to be stealing a march on the competition. You need to be doing something that's going to make you unique. So, what is a training contract? Well, a training contract is a very specific thing. It's a two-year, effectively, an apprenticeship at a law firm where you have to fulfil certain uh, obligations and duties and, and tasks in order for you to be signed off uh, by the, uh, the SRA as being uh, qualified to move on to the status of a qualified solicitor. It's a very specific uh, part of the process. It may not even be there for very long because at the moment there is uh, much regulatory debate about whether the uh, current regime for producing new lawyers is going to remain the same, and you should know about that, there's plenty to read up on that. But as it stands, without a training contract, in most cases, you cannot become a solicitor. So you very much immediately, if you want to become a solicitor, have to look at how am I going to win a training contract. That is one of your primary goals along the way to success in the profession. Now there are other routes through the profession which we'll perhaps have a look at in a minute that don't necessarily require a training contract, however if you want to be a barrister you will normally have to do something called a pupillage, which is effectively a training contract for barristers. It's again on the job training that is an intrinsic part of the process for becoming signed off as a qualified lawyer. So this will then beg the question, if I need one of these things, when do I start looking for it? Well the answer is now. The race for your training contract already started, it started years ago. Because all the time that you can devote in advance to making applications for training contracts, for making applications for jobs, is time well spent in building up your knowledge and understanding and skills and competencies and all those good, wonderful things that an employer is looking for when they look at your CV or your application for a job. So where do I go for information and advice? Well, if you want to become a lawyer, you're blessed. There is a vast amount of information out there. My two publications, the Training Contracts on People's Handbook and Law Careers Net, are, I like to say, the market leaders. Others may disagree. But we have, because we are in a market where there is some stiff competition, there are three or four other resources that are available out there as well. So information is out there. The problem is it's out there for everybody. It's out there for absolutely every one of you in this room. So if you've not read it, and he, he and he has read it, you are behind immediately. So, the information is there, is there, you've got to use it. Um, but what I think it's very important to say is that this seems like a rather terrifying process. This seems like the process is going to really intimidate, it's really hard, it's climbing a mountain. 
However, what I'm going to try and do today is give you some indications of some of the techniques and processes that if you follow them, you massively increase, increase your chances of success. And the really good news for you is that a lot of people in this market do not follow those rules. If you speak to any recruiter at a law firm, they will say, I've actually rejected half these applications straight off the bat because they have quite clearly not done the really base level of due diligence, be that about the content, the style, the information and the evidence. Lots of people are very easy to reject. First rule, don't be one of them. So, don't play catch up. The basics are out there. The information is all there on Law Careers Net and plenty of other places. And that information covers a number of things. What do lawyers do? What are the different types of lawyers? Obviously you've got barristers, you've got solicitors. You've got lawyers that work in family, you've got lawyers that work in criminal, you've got commercial lawyers, you've got conveyancers. There's a lots of different... The, the legal profession is a broad church with people doing a lot of different things under that one umbrella. We provide information on how to distinguish between those different aspects and also what characterises the work, what characterises the skills that you need, perhaps attributes you should have if you want to pursue those specific, specific areas. There is no excuse for not knowing this. In fact, until you do know this stuff, why on earth would you be making an application? Because you don't know enough stuff to make an application. That's the truth. Um, there's also different types of firm. A firm that you deal with for buying your house, or perhaps executing the will of someone in your family, will be an entirely different firm to a firm like, say, DWF, who are a large commercial law firm who work in the business world, both domestically and internationally. They're doing, they're both employing lots of lawyers and doing lots and, and doing legal work, but actually they're worlds apart. So actually, again, you've got to understand what are the different kinds of firms. What are the different classes of firms? Which am I interested in? How am I going to demonstrate that I understand what these different types of organisations do? And that's all about getting the basics in there. Furthermore, once you've got the basics, you're going to be able to talk more intelligently to potential employers, to people giving you advice, to your peer group about the process you're going through in looking for a career in law. If you haven't done the people you're talking to the courtesy of having done your basic due diligence of knowing the basics about what's happening in this profession, what it's all about, you can really understand that they might not be that keen on giving you a lot of their time, a lot of their attention, if they're having to fill you in on stuff that you should know about. <coughs> so do your, do your basic bit of work. You can do it any time, and you can't take it all in at once. It's something you're going to need to work on on a day-by-day -day basis. We'll get back to this. But there's an overload of information out here, and you've got to keep trip tripping away. Think much like uh, training for the 10,000 meters. Well, you don't just sort of have an energy drink the day before, turn up at the, at the starting line, and expect to give your best performance. Months and months and months and months and months of training is what leads to a good campaign for getting a job in the profession. So, Let's assume you've looked at the basics, you've kind of got a grasp on how it all works, what different kind of lawyers do. You may have even got some kind of idea of which bit you're interested in. Now you've got to immerse yourself. Now you've got the skeleton, you've got to put some flesh on it. So, one of the things that we provide at Law Careers Net is a regular weekly email, where we've got news, and we've got features, and we've got updates, and we've got profiles. Lots of information that is relevant to the whole process of finding a job in law. Some of it would be right bang on the money and exactly what you're looking for, telling you what you should be doing at that time of the year. Others might be profiles of somebody doing one kind of job, where you'll just perhaps pick up a few more bits of information about what that kind of person does. But collectively, the reading, the understanding, is what gives you a rounded understanding of the profession and goes towards making you a credible potential lawyer. Because when you meet law firms, when you meet potential employers, what they're looking for is, is this person one of us? Is this person I can see, a person I can see in my practice 
working in my profession, interacting with my colleagues. Is that the kind of person? Do they have the right stuff? And this is one of the ways in which you're going to get it. So regular reading, let me make some suggestions. Obviously, the kind of information that I produce as a specialist careers information provider, but also the trade press. We heard before Abraham talking about the Lawyer, Legal Week, the Law Society's Gazette. You also have uh, the Law Pages in the Times, the Law Pages in the Guardian. All of this stuff is relevant. You may want to be a commercial lawyer, but understanding what's going on in the whole world of legal aid within the profession as a whole is something that you should know about. You're a part of this profession still. You should still know about it. It might not have an enormous direct relevance to your own practice, but that's part of the mix. Um, you've also got um, to understand how to market knowledge. So remember that law is part of the wider economy. It's part of the wider society. So how does law, how does law impinge on the business world? Well, first of all, you've got to have an idea of what's happening in the business world. So if you're interested in business law, perhaps you should be reading the business pages of the newspapers, Financial Times, those sort of things, and perhaps spotting where law firms um, are, taking, uh, are, are, are involved. Perhaps you want to be in another area of law and you look, want to be looking at what's happening in society as a whole, looking at what happens in child protection, what happens in landlord and tenant legislation. All that information is pertinent to the activities of lawyers, and you need to have a general, informed member of the public's understanding of what's going on in the world, because lawyers are emphatically part of the world, of the informed world. You don't want to be the ignoramus who just doesn't understand what's going on around them, because you get pulled up for that. Um, so what I said before is, once you are developing this kind of understanding, you can speak to lawyers, but you can speak their own language to them. You can be understanding what they do, you can ask them questions that show genuine insight, uh, you can perhaps understand what the in-jokes, what the worries for them are. Now these are all things that are going to lead to you being able to effectively, shall we say, network, for you to build up a rapport with these individuals, to either impress them directly as potential employers, to get them to give you insights and understandings that you, they previously wouldn't necessarily be able to offer to you and generally to increase your knowledge. So remember, when you are meeting lawyers, when you are meeting people who are part of the profession, this is a great opportunity for you to keep building your knowledge, to keep sort of working out where you are and where your level of understanding is. And of course, the best way to immerse yourself in the, in the legal world, the business world, the societal world, is to be doing work experience, be doing volunteering, all those things that uh, are the, the mainstay of a CV's evidence that says, not only am I talking a good game, I'm, up, I'm obviously walking the good game as well, because here are the examples of the things I have done, the experiences I have had, and in turn, how I've developed skills, how I've developed understanding, what I have learned. It's also about effective and detailed research. Let's assume that you are now understanding what's going on in the basics, your reading is good, you're talking intelligently to people. You also need some pretty detailed, specific, specific research. Um, first of all, write down perhaps what you perceive the key skills and competencies for being a lawyer might be. Actually, a lot of them are the key skills and competencies for any activity in the world of work. They're looking for intelligence. They're looking for motivation. They're looking for the ability to communicate. They're looking for the ability to work in teams. They're looking for attention to detail. They're looking for drive and motivation. All these kind of things. It seems pretty self-evident. But again, if you're thinking about these things, you've got to work out what your evidence is that you have them. That should always be in the back of your mind. Where is my evidence to back up? my perceptions of what is a good thing in an application, a thing that is going to impress an employer. You need to actually understand the employers. You're applying to DWF. Can you tell them what DWF stands for? You've already had that question. Davis Wallace Foster. You've got to know that perhaps there used to be a sort of mid-sized Northwestern law firm who in recent years have taken a massive growth upwards, have become very aggressive within their markets, 
and really left many of their competitors behind. That's the kind of thing you've got to be able to show that you understand when you meet somebody from that firm. Does that sound about right? <laughs> um, so, yeah, when you're looking at a specific employer, perhaps have a little checklist. Where have they come from? What's their history? What are their main practice areas? Where do they make their money? What are their ethics? What are their beliefs? What's their general message? Where do we think they're going? What's happened to them? What's their profitability like? All this kind of information is out there. You've got to go and pick it out and use it to tell the difference between different organisations. And you've also got to be using that information to demonstrate to those firms that you are a sophisticated and well-informed applicant. But it's not only the employers you need to do it analyse. You need to analyse yourself. This is where probably the biggest failing comes from in candidates. If you speak to employers, they will always say, yeah, he sounded pretty good, but I didn't actually get enough of him or her about why they were good. I didn't really have the, the empirical, boiled down evidence, understanding about that person himself. So what, we want, what I want you to do is actually look at yourself and go through a process, much the same as the process you go through when you're looking at a specific employer. Who am I? What are all the things I have done? Be it work, be it education, be it the general other life extracurricular activities. What are the specific activities I have done that somebody else might be interested in? And in turn, where have they shown the skills or the development or the increase in knowledge that I think I might be able to use as evidence to an employer? Now, we can all think of our few greatest hits, but it's not about doing that. It's actually about going through your life with a fine tooth comb, pulling out all the good stuff, and arranging it on paper, on a list, or indeed even using your personal accountable or careers net, my LCN, where we actually have a section called myself, where you can actually use uh, that to um, record specific bits of work you've done, record specific actions that you have done and in turn score those against some of the core competencies. But it's about doing a specific process. It's not just sort of picking it out of the air. Just do, do the hard, hard graph. Much like Abraham said with the uh, colleague who has a 10 page CV. Get all the stuff there out and written down and then you can use it like, like ingredients in a menu to cook up the perfect dish, which is your application. The other thing about MyLCN is you can also save the names of individual law firms to your personal account, and again, keep your notes there in one place. But again, I'm looking for you to do a systematic process. That's the secret. It's about being systematic. And guess what? That's kind of what lawyers do as well. Um, I think we've gone through a certain amount of this anyway with Abraham's talk, so I'll whip through it. But attention to detail, lawyers do detail. That's all there is to it. So, bad spelling, bad punctuation, Americanisations, all that stuff. You know, there's really no excuse. So, as Abraham said, don't fire it off the second you type the last thing. Sleep on it, get somebody else to read it. Here's what I learnt uh, this week. Read it aloud. There's nothing like reading it aloud in an application to suddenly go, God, that sentence doesn't work. But I, I know what I'm trying to say in it, so I've just been glossing over it. So all that detailed stuff is really important. Again, things like making sure you're talking about the right organisation. It's, it's self-evident. It's almost insulting to tell you this, but it's where people fall down on a regular basis. Um, so again, the employer-specific knowledge, every application should be tailored. Um, and that comes down to the next point as well. You cannot do a beautifully tailored, perfectly executed application to 100 different employers. You haven't got time. Trust me, you haven't got time. Once you're getting above five or six, you're probably sacrificing quality for quantity. Now, I appreciate that you've, there is always going to be a trade-off between trying to roll the dice as many times as you can uh, and actually getting there to the job. But really, really, don't... Well, 100 applications will be 100 bad applications. You've wasted your time. So you've got to work out what the balance is. And it's almost, if you've got your technique, your, your pre, your, your template for what I do per application, which involves lots of due diligence, lots of checking and rechecking, 
that's an almost how long that process takes should define how many applications you realistically feel you can make. <coughs> and remember, you are selling yourself. You know, it's it's about it's about you. Again, think about what what you have to offer. Think about how that matches up with the organisation. It's it's actually really, people traditionally have found it very difficult in many ways to really analyse themselves. There's something there's something pretty scary about looking deep into the soul of your competence and then trying to say to somebody else, "Go on, please give me a chance." So you know you've got to, you've got to bite the bullet. You've got to do that process in order to get ahead. And finally, lack of evidence. That just goes back to what I've been saying. If you haven't done your core research, your multi-layered, this is what's required, have I got it, put it into place, there it is. You're not providing enough evidence. So always, always think, am I pre presenting a credible case here? So, what happens next? There's plenty of other aspects here. I haven't really talked, for instance, about what to do when you go to an event where there's going to be lawyers present. Pretty much the answer is prepare. Always be prepared. Every time you meet someone, it's an opportunity. But first of all, you've got to set yourself some targets. Now, wherever you are in the process, whether you're, uh, you've completed all your formal education, you've completed an LPC, and you're now trying to get whatever kind of work you can, fine, make a plan based on that. If you're in the happy position that you're a first year undergraduate, and all that stuff's there in front of you, well, again, you, you've got to make a different plan. But the key is, you need to make that plan starting from year zero now. What have I achieved so far? What of this stuff have I actually done? How am I going to fill in all those gaps? When are the watersheds of when I'm going to be making applications? You can't, if you haven't done all this previous stuff, don't bother making applications tomorrow because they probably won't be any good. So what's realistic in my interim and my long term and my medium term process? Fill in the skills gaps. Your, your, your painful self-analysis will almost certainly have revealed that there are bits of stuff that you're not as good at as you might be. Can you do something to fill in those gaps? If you can, there you go. Finally, uh, use the advice you can get. Uh, you will generally have been or be attached to uh, a university who will have a, have a career service. They're a very good starting point. They do this stuff all the time. For things like checking applications, getting general advice about how to flesh out what you've achieved, they're really good starting points. But there are lots of other resources as well. It's a question of Take advantage of everything that's there in front of you, because again, back to my very first point, it's a game, everybody else is playing it, it's up to you to play it best. Mm -hmm.